It's J300 again, uh, this time with a mysteriously le titled lecture, The Dress as a Color Experiment. Some of you might already be guessing uh, what this is about, but for those of you who um, don't know, um, let's dive right in. And that is, um, look at this little swatch here. Um, what color do you perceive that little swatch as? What color is that? And furthermore, what color is this when you look at it as an individual swatch? So those might seem like fairly pedestrian questions. Some of you might say, well, obviously this is color blank. And obviously this is color blank. But um, it turns out that asking those questions of you um, can reveal quite a bit about not just color, but maybe even some stuff about you. So what do I mean by that? So the previous lecture that we did, Notes on Color, I was basically making an argument over and over again, and I was kind of making fun of someone at the same time, right? I was making fun of the dorm room stoner who says, what if my green is not the same as your green? What if my blue is not the same as your blue, right? But I was making this argument in other ways too, besides disparaging poor stoner dorm boy. And that was that I was saying that color can be empirically described as a scientific factual phenomenon, right? That when I look at the RGB color on the right hand side of that photograph of a turtle, that it tells me that it is R, R value 95, it is G value 119, and it is B value 57, that I can describe it as that way and that that is a scientific way of doing it, right? That colors have numeric value and that we perceive those things based on that numeric value. That it has hue, it has saturation, it has value, it has lightness, it has all of those things and we should be able to um, quantify those things very scientifically, right? I also argued with things like that um, American flag um, you know, optical illusion at the bottom there, that the physics of vision, that cones and rods and those kinds of things, that they tell us a lot about how we see things in the world, right? This, of course, assumes that we're not talking about someone who has vision impairment, whether it be color blindness or anything else like that, right? Again, if I describe these um, these very technical terms, hue, saturation, lightness, that we should be able to see the same thing whether you're in Tokyo or whether you're in Timbuktu or whether um, you're in Overland Park, right? I should be able to see the same things um, as you, right? And that argument is mostly true, and that's why I made it. But the problem is that sometimes it is not. Sometimes that argument is a little bit quirky and it gets scrambled and it gets blended up and um, we get tangled up in it. And that is when we can say, um, enter the dress, right? That's when we can say that sometimes there is a phenomenon out there that messes with us. And that is the topic of this lecture, the enter the dress and the elasticity of perception. I love that phrase, elasticity of perception. And basically what that says is that, yeah, we perceive things, but sometimes our perception can be um, very, very elastic, that it can be changed and that it can uh, you know, not be what it seems. So here it is, there's the dress. And some of you look at this dress and you say, yes, that is a blue and a black dress. And why are we talking about this? And some of you say, did you just say blue and black? That is not a blue and black dress. That is a white and a brown dress. And I don't understand how somebody would see it either way. Some of you are sitting out there and saying, oh my gosh, a few years ago, I saw this as being blue and black. And now I'm seeing it as, it as the opposite. I'm seeing it as that white and brown or white and gold um, phenomenon that you just talked about. And some of you have flipped the other way. And that is because this dress is what we would call in my son's language, weird. It is an incredible phenomenon of perception where our, per, our perception is very elastic when we look at this dress. So what is going on here? Well, first of all, this is a social media phenomenon that hit uh, a few years ago, more than five years ago now. And when it hit, people were really taken aback 
and uh, we all stared at our phones and we all argued um, with one another. And I have to say, this is a kind of a bummer of a lecture to deliver via the internet because people generally turn to the person next to them and say, how could someone see this color in it? And the other person says, well, I see that color in it. So, uh, so yeah, that's, uh, that's what's going on when we see this. So let's explain it. Let's try to break it down into some basic principles and try to figure out what it means in terms of color, right? The first principle is this, that our context of our perception matters. Now we've talked about this before. We, we talked about this when we looked at the blue square that was surrounded in green and the blue square that was surrounded in orange. And we said the surrounding colors really influence what's going on here. And so that is what's actually on display here. It's not as simple as those orange and blue and green colors were, but it is something that um, works on the same basic principles, right? The basic principles are that in these cases, our brain makes what's called an unconscious inference, right? That our brain is willing to look at those colors and say, oh, I'm gonna make this choice about what that color is. It's not something that you are consciously deciding. You're not deciding uh, you know, to eat a sandwich or to uh, you know, throw a ball or something like that. It's unconscious. You're actually um, not in control of that decision in kind of a real way. So um, what does unconscious inference look like in other situations? So if we look at this right here, clearly which way is that dot moving? Almost everybody would say that dot is moving from left to right and from right to left. And then we would say, well, that's pretty clear. But what happens if we look at this series? Well, if we look at this, it's pretty clear that that is moving from left to right and right to left, just in a different space, right? And if we look at it here, it's moving up and down and down and up. And if we look at it here, it's moving up and down and down and up again. But the reality of it is that your brain is making all of that happen. It's not actually moving, right? What is happening is not movement at all. So go ahead and use your hand and shield the bottom two of those dots. And what you see is that there appears to be moving left and right, but if you go ahead and shield the um, left and right ones, or the right hand side of the illusion here, then you'll see that it's moving up and down. And if you go ahead and just turn it so that one of those is showing, then what you'll see is that just one dot is turning on and off. It's really just four dots that are turning on and off, and we're willing to make them move up and down and left and right, depending on what we're presented with. So the context matters, right? Really, that dot is just turning on and off in four different locations, and we're willing to say that it's moving. That's an example of unconscious inference. Another one would be this. Because you see the word mammals under here, you're more likely to see it as being a mammal, right? And this right here, if you just see it on its own, you might go ahead and see it as being a rabbit, right? But if you go ahead and see it this way, you are much more likely to see it as being a bird. It's not something that you are actually making a decision about. You're not saying, I want to see bird here, but instead you are um, able to see it because of the context that's surrounding it. The fact that it has a bird on there makes us more likely to do it. And same thing if we see it with even more context, right? We're more likely to see a, ma a mammal as being one thing or a bird as being another if we're presented with lots and lots of context around the sides of it. Now, before I go to this next slide, I'm gonna just go ahead and say, this is a lot of text on one slide. Don't even try to write down all the text on this slide because I'm gonna move past it too quickly. But I love this quote, and it's actually two slides long on a, of a quote. So I'm gonna read it to you. Consider this part, and this is from Pascal Wallach, and he teaches psychology and neuroscience at New York University. You didn't think this was coming as part of a journalism lecture today. The brain lives in a bony shell. The completely light tight nature of the skull renders this home a place of complete darkness. So the brain relies on the eyes to supply an image of the outside world, but there are many processing steps between the translation of light energy into electronic impulses that happen in the eye and the neural activity that corresponds to a conscious perception of the outside world. 
Now, what are we supposed to write down about this? What are we supposed to take away from it? The first thing to take away from it is that the brain isn't actually seeing what is happening out in the world. It's in its bony shell, as Wallace says here. And instead, it's relying on a whole bunch of steps to happen between the eye and your brain. And some of that stuff is going to lead to some sort of um, you know, neuroscience reactions that are happening here. Slide number two as part of this. In other words, the brain is playing a game of telephone, and contrary to popular belief, our perception corresponds to the brain's best guess of what is going on in the outside world, not necessarily to the way that things actually are. Now, that italicized part might be worth writing down in your notes there, because I think it's kind of profound and kind of interesting, the idea that the brain's best guess of what's going on in the outside world. Now, the stoner in his dorm room says, hey, this is what I was talking about the whole time. It's the brain's best guess of what's going on, right? And I think that there's a little bit of space that we need to give to that gentleman now, right? Because this is, uh, this is the reality of what's going on with the dress and some of our perception, right? Principle number two that we need to understand about the dress and how it works, right? And that's the second bullet point. W one core portion of that perception is the assumed illumination of the scene, the assumed illumination of the scene. What does that mean? Well, we talked in the earlier lecture about this idea of color temperature, right? The idea that when certain colors of light are projected onto things that they take on a different look, right? That warm colors and cool colors have a different effect on what we're looking at here, right? So this is a great example of it, and it comes from Stefan Burrill's lecture that I uh, stole from in our last lecture as well, and this is a great screen grab from it, and it's just a cathedral, right? And this is Claude Monet's um, paintings of this one cathedral and none of us right as modern viewers of these 10 different images think that Monet in this case painted an actual orange cathedral that the cathedral was actually had was made of orange stone or that it was made of blue stone at other times or that it was made of brown stone in other times we know that the illumination is part of what we're seeing here right so what does that look like as a diagram what it looks like as a diagram is that we see a bunch of light hitting a um, surface that surface absorbs some colors right and then it reflects other colors and those colors are sensed by the eye, right? So we are, every time that we're looking at something, we're tr our eye, our brain, is trying to make a calculation and say, how much of this color is based on the light that it's in, and how much of this color that I'm seeing is based on the actual color of the thing? And sometimes, when we're making that guess, our brain literally has to make a guess. And sometimes it guesses wrong, and sometimes it guesses right, correct? So here's what an example of that, right? Here's a Rubik's Cube, right? And we know that on the left-hand side there that that blue dot that's being pointed to by that arrow is a very different color from that yellow that's over there on the right-hand side. Of course, because it's an optical illusion, it is not going to be that simple, right? What we actually see when we limit the field of view for each of those is that both of those colors are actually neutral gray. And that we, because we are people in the world who are making unconscious inferences, we see that yellow on the left-hand side as being the illuminant of that scene and we perceive that gray color to be blue because the whole time we're processing this is a yellow this is yellow scene this is a yellow scene there's a yellow light happening there it's actually not happening right it's gray but our brain is making that leap right over on the right hand side we see a yellow square but we perceive a blue illuminant in there and so our brain is making that unconscious inference the whole time if we actually use the colors that were in the dress we can see that there are two very very different dresses being worn here one in a blue scene and one in a yellow scene and of course because it's an optical illusion it's going to turn out that actually they aren't different dresses they are actually the same color on the top of that dress and they are the same color on the bottom of that dress. Even though they seem different, that is because of the illuminant. 
that dog outside agrees. I'm going to go ahead and pause really quickly and close the window so that he doesn't uh, disrupt the rest of the lecture here. All right, I'm back from the doggy break. Uh, that was the next door neighbor's dog. Sorry about that. So uh, we were talking about these colors, right? So what conclusions can we draw from what we're looking at here? Is this anything that we should be concerned about as designers and as journalists? And I would say a couple things. First, the dress is a very rare image, one that um, researchers are super, super interested in, but it is not something that happens all the time, but it reveals something that does happen all the time to a much smaller extent, right? And for this reason, re researchers have been trying to find other um, images like this and try to figure out what are some other ones that um, people have interesting reactions to. The reason that researchers are interested in the dress and were interested in the dress as um, a particular experiment is because the dress really divided people. Oftentimes when these kind of images come up, there's just maybe 10% of the of people feel this way and 90% feel this way. But this was much more closer to half and half feeling that way. And that's why it was a social media phenomenon. And that's why um, we're talking about it today, right? The other thing that is interesting about this that we've already kind of touched on is the idea that color perception is not just based on the numbers that are sitting in the CMYK value or the RGB value of a color. The color that we see is also part of some unconscious inference and it's also part of the illuminate that it's being seen in. So if you're a designer and you know that everybody's gonna be reading your product in a fluorescent room, then you should design it differently than if you know that everybody's going to be reading your object in bright sunlight or if they're gonna be reading it in a dark room. Um, you should design things differently with the illuminate in mind. And finally, um, sometimes in rare instances, right, the um, illuminant that we perceive, the thing that we think is coloring that room is up to the viewer. The viewer actually makes that um, call on their own through this idea of unconscious inference, right? Um, there's a new uh, wrinkle in this that I think is fun to update you on. There's been researchers who have played around with this and they have played around with this idea of who are people who see it one way and who are people that see it another way. And what they said is, they said, let's divide people into LARC, which are people who are most likely to wake up early in the day. People who get up at 6 a.m. almost every day and see the world that way, right? They are more likely to see the world in natural light. And maybe, just maybe, that influences whether they see the dress as one way or another, right? The theory goes that larks, people who wake up early, are more likely to see that dress as white and gold. So what does that mean, right? Larks are more likely to wake early, and so they are going to see this dress as being white and gold. What is the quality of light when it's the morning? The quality of light in the morning is going to be more blue. It's going to be a more blue light, and so we are experiencing things more often in that kind of light, and so we are more likely to see it that way. Um, what if you're an owl, right? What if you are more likely to be awake in dark moments of the day? Maybe you're more likely to see life in this artificial light. And if you are likely to see that in artificial light, you are more likely to assume that the dress is blue or black. This is kind of a test theory. People aren't totally sure if that's the case. Does that correspond with you? Are you a lark or are you an owl? And does it influence whether or not you uh, see it one way or another. Some researchers think that this might be why some people saw the dress as one way a few years ago, and then now when they revisit the dress, they see it a different way because their sleep patterns have changed. This might be true for you because you might have been a really uh, early riser in high school and we're up at 6.20 in the morning and we're off to school, whereas now, I don't know, maybe you're sleeping in a little bit more as a college student, and so that might um, influence the change that you're going through.
right? So this is the conclusion that this uh, researcher found, and this is exactly what the researcher found. The effect is subtle but statistically reliable and dose-dependent, meaning how much you get up early and how much you don't get up early. In other words, the more someone self-identified as a lark, the more likely he or she was to see the dress image as white or gold. Moreover, and to tie everything up in a bow, owls were more likely to assume that the lighting was artificial and not natural, right? So just an interesting uh, little bit of trivia, right? So what does this say about my earlier argument? Is color scientific and empirical? Is it a fact or should we give again our friend from the dorm room some uh, credit as saying yeah maybe it is a little bit uh, unconscious and the idea is that mostly yes. As an isolated description of color Color is mostly scientific and empirical, but in more complex situations and places where things are a little bit uh, more hazy and where things could be misunderstood, um, it's not completely true. So I am sorry for disparaging you, my friend from the dorm, right? So I'm sorry, this is actually what the dress looks like. It was photographed by a mother who was out bridesmaids uh, shopping with bridesmaids dress shopping with her daughter and her daughter's friends, uh, I believe in New Zealand uh, years ago, and this is what it looks like. Uh, you don't have to like the dress, you don't have to uh, go out and buy it yourself, uh, but this is what it looked like actually uh, in with a neutral illuminate, if you will. Some other images have come uh, to light since then. Uh, you know, Some people have uh, looked at this particular image and said that it's very interesting in terms of um, people seeing whether the strawberries are red or whether the strawberries are gray. If we look at just an isolated swatch of those uh, strawberries, you'll see just how gray they are and how maybe some of us are willing to um, add a little bit of um, red to them to factor in what the illuminate is, whereas there's actually not very much red in them at all. So uh, if you're interested in further reading, here's a whole bunch of other uh, links. You can find those in the slides that are linked on Blackboard. Uh, just a short lecture, just a quirky lecture, um, and I hope you enjoyed it. I'll talk to you next week, and we'll uh, start diving into some more page design stuff so we can get you closer to your infographic. Uh, have a great weekend. Take care. Bye.